Good afternoon. This is our last and fourth session of the day. We have four excellent speakers, and the first will be uh, Lori Pastor Yak Lamar, and she will be speaking on uh, the True Sword Unique Memories and Legacies of the Pequot War. Uh, and she is a museum professional with a bachelor's for history and anthropology from UConn and an MA in museum education from Tufts. She has held positions of management and leadership with the United States uh, ship, ship Constitution up in Massachusetts. She's uh, been with the Mattituck Museum in Waterbury and the Lebanon Historical Society. Uh, she has contributed articles to FOSS's newsletter on the Mashantucket Pequot Archaeological Field School, as well as updates on the two battlefields of the Pequot War that the tribe is engaged in, uh, in at the assistance of the National Park Service American Battlefields Programs. She is also involved in the Indian Memories Project. And so, Lori Pastia. Thank you, Faith. In the Mystic Pioneer on July 30th, 1859, I tried to secure the old blade. I employed the most powerful purchases. I applied the power of love. I tried the potency of money, but all was in vain. Like the old warrior owner, its present proprietors were invincible. I was obliged to retreat without the spoils, and I freely confess that I do not censure the family pride and patriotism that, with such a tenacious grasp, hold the ancient, blood-dipped family sword. Near dawn on May 26, 1637, Captain John Mason led a force of approximately 300 English and Native Allied troops in an attack on the fortified Pequot village of Mystic. As a result, hundreds of Pequot were killed and the English established military dominion by right of conquest. English Pequot war veterans settled there less than a decade later, and generations following, their descendants have kept the legacy of that war alive. Their accounts recall, some painfully and some admirably, the events that took place at Mystic Fort. These memories exist in newspapers, diaries, and museum collections, and are often associated or attributed to specific items and individuals. Perhaps the most noteworthy, John Mason left behind formidable items, including an ancient blood-dipped family sword. This paper attempts to explore the history of Mason's legacy through the objects and the documents he left behind and the stories they still share with us today. More than two decades ago, the Mashantucket Pequot tribe and a team of researchers worked to identify material culture associated with the war. These artifacts were to supplement an exhibit in the tribe's museum. Researchers learned to, of two weapons attributed to Mason. One, a sword displayed at the Lighthouse Museum in Stonington Borough with the Stonington Historical Society, and the other, a rapier, in the collections of the New London County Historical Society. Do, the New London rapier was loaned to the Mashantucket Pequot Museum, and the museum's head of conservation, Doug Curry, worked to research the sword. Curry analyzed the rapier and was perplexed by its condition of its parts, as well as the provenance, which noted this was Mason's venerated battle blade. The story the object told was much different. The blade looked as if it was found archaeologically. The Brazilian rosewood grip of the rapier was from the 19th century. The style of the blade, the hilt, the etchings were typical of the second half of the 17th century, and although the oral history stated it was from earlier years. The decorations on the hilt and the blade were elaborate and expensive, not something a soldier would have carried through battle. Thus, there was a mystery. Mason's life, his origins, and his objects came to life while researching the New London County Historical Society's rapier and the Stonington Historical Society's sword due to the Battlefields of the Pequot War Project here at the museum. Head conservator Doug Curry and his analysis of the swords has helped complete this narrative of Mason's life and legacy for this presentation. Nearly 400 years ago, in a cotton in the town of Solingen, Germany, a sword grinder fashioned a broad steel blade to suit its bearer during battle. When complete, his guild mark 
a crossed orb by patriarchal Christian, Christian cross and his initials were engraved C.S. C stood for Clemens and S repeated to emphasize the family name was either Schaff, von Schicken, Soder, or Stoll. Stamped Mephesit Soligen, the blade was shipped away to the war-stricken Low Countries, Amsterdam, in the first quarter of the 17th century. Meanwhile, an English soldier in his roaring twenties named John Mason gained military experience. New evidence suggests Mason hailed from Farn, Northumberland, and served in the Low Countries, where he gained military prowess, leadership qualities, and fortification skills. In 1736, Thomas Prince wrote that Mason was trained up in the Netherland War under Sir Thomas Fairfax. There is no reason to doubt Prince's knowledge, as Prince retained it from Mason's grandson, John Mason III. Biographers note that an 18-year-old Fairfax served only four months in 1629 in the Netherlands under Sir Horace Vere at the Siege of bois le duc Mason's rank and responsibilities gained notice from the company elite from whom Fairfax would have been learning the art of war. Fairfax, although several years younger than Mason, was well connected. His father was a member of parliament. Fairfax contacted Mason again years later in a request for military service and eventually ended up marrying, marrying Horace Vere's daughter. Mason was armed with, with a sword before his migration to Massachusetts Bay Colony in 1632. He obtained his broad steel blade in the Low Countries the blade produced in Solingen. The blade was completed in Amsterdam with a hilt and pommel, as evidenced by the duty symbol added to imported blades which required hilts and were to be sold. The hilt, a type identified as Walloon, named after the metalsmithing region of Wallonia, was commonly used in Northwest Europe and the Netherlands during the 17th century. The Walloon hilt is sturdy, economical, and meant to be used in actual military service. The pommel of the sword acts as a counterweight to the heavy, steel, broad, double blade. Mason traveled to Massachusetts Bay with his broadsword from Europe and settled in Dorchester by 1632. Governor John Withrop commissioned him as a lieutenant for an unsuccessful assignment to seek the English pirate Dixie Bull and in the fortifications at Massachusetts Bay. By 1635, Mason removed to the new Dorchester, or Windsor, a new settlement in the Connecticut River Valley. In 1637, Captain John Mason was named commander of forces in the May 1st declaration of war against the Pequot tribe. Mason was instrumental in Connecticut Colony's plan and the altered plan of attack. He led the force from Saybrook to Narragansett and, into, and through Pequot country. Mason's subsequent military report and account of the Pequot War is necessary to understand his actions, specifically the attack and the decision to burn Mystic Fort. Numerous sources include Mason's primary recollections of the war, and they became the groundwork for countless future conflicts and discourse between Connecticut and other entities for the next 150 years, especially that of the Mohegan tribe and disputes regarding Connecticut's political boundaries. After the Pequot War's conclusion, on September 21, 1638, with the Chartford Treaty, Mason gained notoriety. By 47, he was appointed Saybrook Fort Commander, and through the next 30 years was noted as commissioner, magistrate, deputy governor, major, and finally patentee of Connecticut colony from the British crown. At some point, Mason obtained a presentation or mortuary rapier, and he was granted nearly a thousand acres of Pequot dispossessed, or quote, con conquest land. In particular, a place known as Mason's Island. He was instrumental in treaties with the local natives. Uncas, Mohegan leader and Mason's ally during the Pequot War, in his political savvy, placed Mohegan lands into Mason's hands in trust. But in doing so, this inadvertently opened their kin and descendants into decades of property and leadership litigation between the British Crown, local English settlers, Connecticut authorities, and the Mohegan tribe. This, quote, Mason case, or, quote, Mohegan land controversy, created a paper trail, and when pursued, enlightened researchers with a unique understanding of how both colonial and native peoples navigated each other's political and legal systems, as well as insight into the Mason family. John Mason died in January 1672, at the age of 72, of ye stone of strangery of some such disease. The demise of his health was slow and painful, either due to kidney stones or failure or bladder cancer. 
Biographers of Mason claim that his will and inventory had never been found. However, they just may be looking in the wrong places. The principal reason many of Mason's probates, deeds, and letters are difficult to locate is because the originals were actually destroyed, altered, or relocated due to the, quote, Mason case, or, quote, Mohegan land controversy. Two important documents of Mason and the Pequot War were found among evidence used in courts during the controversy, one being a portion of Mason's will, as well as an unpublished 1665 copy of the 1638 tripartite Hartford Treaty that ended the Pequot War. This copy of the Hartford Treaty contains additional provisions which focus not on debilitating the Pequot tribe, where most historians tend to focus when studying this treaty, but on the pending Mohegan and Narragansett relationship and moving forward with each other and with the English. In the portion of Mason's will, he left the majority of his Stonington land, specifically the Great Island, now known as Mason's Island, to his son Daniel. This corroborates not only with the family's oral history, but also the tale of Mason's two swords. Both the broadsword and rapier were prominently recalled by family and antiquarians during the 19th and 20th centuries. They were considered by some as symbols of, quote, American patriotism and showcased for their legacy as tangible evidence of historic events. After Mason's death in 1672, family oral history recalled his swords were inherited by Captain Daniel, Mason's youngest son. With additional oral history, the swords were then bequeathed to Mamaya and next to Andrew. These men were proprietors on the family namesake of Mason's Island, and the weapons never left the property. Andrew Mason, in 1781, split the two blades, one bestowed to his nephew, Andrew Gallup. Gallup, remarkably, was also a Pequot War veteran descendant, but he survived the Battle of Groton Heights just one result of Benedict Arnold's treason against American colonial forces. Gallup, an artillery man of a regular garrison, was struck by a musket ball and stabbed with a bayonet as he lay helpless on the ground. He recovered and died in 1853, nearly 92 years old. He descended from John Mason, a sword of whom he received from his mother's brother, who was third in the line of direct descent from the famous John. His uncle Andrew presented him with the sword of his ancestor, to always keep it as a memento of his ancestor's service to the country, and given him on one condition, that it should be kept in the family line. The blade bestowed to Andrew Gallup during the Revolution was the presentation rapier, and although he was instructed to keep it safe, it was nearly lost, not once, but twice during its lifetime. The most remarkable of these losses gave the rapier its confusing but almost archaeological state preservation mentioned earlier. Quote, Andrew's sons, Andrew Henry and Asa Lyman, then young lads, organized a military company of two and armed themselves with the old sword. But a dispute soon arose as to who should be captain of the company, and the sword was dropped in the grass and forgotten. It was not found until six months later, and then much the worse for its long exposure to the elements. The lads learned upon that occasion in the most impressive manner with what value the relic was cherished by their father a love they inherited with mature years." Unquote. Again, in 1876, the rapier was exhibited at the Centennial Celebration in Philadelphia with Miles Standish Furniture, and it was misdirected after the celebration and lost for over a year. When America entered its monument building craze in the post-Civil War era, a committee formed by the New London County Historical Society pursued the Mystic Fort Battlefield site to erect a monument in Mason's memory. Between 1866 and 1887, the Connecticut legislature approved the monument, its site, and style. The dedication ceremony took place in 1889 atop Pequot Hill in Mystic, Connecticut. Isaac Dennison, in his RSVP, shared that the Mason sword is now in the possession of Asa Lyman Gallup of Ledger. Richard A. Wheeler, considered a, quote, man of mark in Connecticut, carried Mason's rapier at the unveiling, where many descendants of Major John Mason were also present. Interestingly enough, the Mason brothers, John V and Andrew of Mason's Island, never RSVP to the gathering and did not attend. Less than five years later, this rapier was donated to the New London County Historical Society, where it still is today. The Mason broadsword, broad sword, however, stayed on Mason's Island with the two Mason brothers. In 1854, the first description of the sword on Mason's Island is, is documented by a witness who visited the homestead. In the possession of the descendants of the old warrior, 
I found the veritable, venerable, glorious old battle blade. The trusty old sword is of ancient English manufacture, of very plain puritanic pattern, double-edged, straight in form, very heavy, and steel throughout, even to its mounting, except the encasing wood and leather to the part grasped by the hand. A small, small portion of the point has been broken off. As now seen, the entire sword is about three feet in length, the blade measures about two feet and a half, and is about two inches broad at the hand. Upon the whole, the old instrument is yet good for many a battle, should it be needed, and the wielding hand must be cold indeed that would not catch a warrior's inspiration from its gory and victorious history." Unquote. In 1914, the Masons lent the broad sword to Stonington for the 1914 centennial celebration, where it was carried in a parade by Charles J. Mason, a seventh generation descendant of John. The sword was donated to the Stonington Historical Society, presented by Elizabeth Colgrove and Dr. Gurdon Allen by 1940. Since the donation, the sword has been in the collections of the Stonington Historical Society and on display at the Old Lighthouse Museum in Stonington Borough. Three years ago, the beginnings of this research was presented for the Stonington Historical Society at a packed house public program, and it was here where both organizations displayed the John Mason swords, reunited for the first time in nearly 250 years. <laughs>